verses 28 through 32. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy and murder and strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do, do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us. Now, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you'd be with this, this message, and that, Lord, our hearts would be touched by your word in this message, and that, Lord, that we would see and hear what you would have for us this day. Thank you, Lord, for it's in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. The word depraved is what I'm looking at. As I think I told you a couple weeks ago, chapter 1 of Romans, is the last half of it is a very, to me, a very sad part of Scripture. Um, it really, really focuses on how bad man is and how God has t just turned us over to our badness and our evilness. He's abandoned us, not because he doesn't love us, but he lets us in many ways, suffer the consequences of our depraved minds. Think about the destruction, if you will, that occurs in our human relationships and in society because of man suppressing the truth of God. We can see it if we're truthful, if we're honest. We can see it all around us. Uh, people, human relationships, marriages, children, husbands, wives, brothers and sisters are hating each other and hurting each other. And, and it's a terrible world in many ways. Our relationships are falling apart. People who crave their sin so strongly, they rebel against God's restraining truth. And because they crave their sin so badly, so strongly, God gives them over to their desire for sin. He allows them to experience the degrading consequences of their sin so that like the prodigal son, they might repent and turn to God. Remember the prodigal son he suffered, he squandered all his money, and he was even eating with the pigs, living with the pigs. So he hit bottom. And that's what happens. It takes that sometimes to return to God. This repent, uh, repentance due to the penalty of their sin is what God desires. But it's not what people desire. God just wants us to turn from our evil ways and come to him. People desire to pursue the way of the world. They will even force the true thoughts of God completely out of their life to do so. And we see that in our world today, I believe, all around us. So when people rebelliously push away from God, he leads them to their sin. And naturally, when people are abandoned by God, they become worse instead of better. They enjoy their depravity. They, they enjoy their sin even though they know they're sinning. And even though they know they deserve death, they still enjoy it. As people get involved in sin, their sin inhibits their willingness. It takes away their ability to form right judgments about life, about each other. And as these people promote their sin to others, Society as a whole itself becomes depraved. That is my concern. My concern is we have to live in this society. We have to live, and our children sometimes are grabbed, and even us are grabbed by society. And it's a depraved society. So let's think about the depraved minds for a second. Verse 28 says, Furthermore, 
just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Uh, to me, again, this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. When people reject God's ways or God's truth, the only way remaining is the way of sin and selfishness. If people do not desire God, if they do not try to follow God, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we're perfect. We're a long way from being perfect, but we try to follow God, don't we? If we don't try to follow God, we'll follow sin. That's a give me. I know that will work. That's the way it is. A mind that will not be corrected by God will become depraved in its thinking, just as what verse 28 says. Human rebellion also includes putting God out of their thoughts or put God away from us. Men force God from their mind. We actually don't even want to think about God. That's the reason some people get mad when we try to witness to them and talk about God and the Bible and Jesus. They get upset. The rejected mind becomes not only, it's a rejected mind. If we reject God, then our mind is rejected. We are rejected. They did not believe it worthy to think about God, so God abandons them to worthless thinking. And they rejected God, and God gave them over to godless thinking. When the mind rejects proper thinking about God, how can the mind still properly think? If we stop thinking about God, how can we think? How can we properly think? See, they rejected God and God gave them over. So, since they did not see fit to retain this acknowledgement of God in their minds, God gave them over to an unfit mind. And a depraved mind is explained in terms of what of what it approves or, or plans. It expresses itself in attitudes and actions that ought to not be done or doing improper things. These are the things that an undepraved mind would regard as wrong. If, we're, if we have the right mind, we know these things are wrong. But a deprived mind thinks it's okay. Notice that the wrong beliefs lead to wrong thinking which leads to wrong actions. So what happens is then we have depraved sins. Verses 29 through 31 of our text list some of these depraved sins. And once the mind becomes depraved, it leads people into a whole variety of antisocial practices which ought not to be done. Together, these practices describe the breakdown of humanity, uh, the community, and all our standards disappear. What happens in a depraved mind, the standards are set by the people instead of a holy person like God. Society and healthy social relationships begin to deteriorate and just go away. The mental vacuum created by dismissing God is filled with <laughs> all kinds of vices, all kinds of evil and bad things because Satan will fill us with all kinds of bad things if we don't have God in us. If we're not thinking about God, he will give us evil thoughts and bad thoughts. The list begins here with four general sins which are fills depraved people. The first is unrighteousness or injustice denoting the absence of what is just. Uh, today we see so many bad judges. Have you noticed in the world it seems like there's no justice. Justice is not there like it used to be because our society is turning from true justice. The Greeks define justice as God uh, given or given to God and to men what is due them. The unjust man is a man who robs both man and God of their rights. So next is the wickedness 
the iniquity or the villainy of things. And in this Greek word, it means more than just being bad. There's a kind of badness which principally hurts only the person that's concerned. Like if I can be just bad, where all I hurt is me. But this kind of wickedness is not only am I bad and I hurt me, but I hurt others. Wickedness is callously and cruel and, and, and that intends to hurt other people. It, it is the active and it's the deliberate will to corrupt and inflict injury on other people. Basically, it's what I simply say, you know what, I will hurt you in order to make myself look right. And that's why we have to be very careful. The third sin is greed or the lust of power. Urges to acquire more. We have urges to get more and more. And it's sort of aggressive vice that pursues one's own interest and pursues its own interest uh, with disregard, total disregard of others. It may operate in any sphere of life. It operates in a material sphere. We move that most of the time. It means grasping at money and goods regardless of any kind of honor or dishonesty or honesty. It doesn't matter. All we're trying to do is get something for ourselves. And the fourth is evil or vile. And this is a general Greek word for one without good qualities. These four express themselves in the following 17 types of more specific breeds of sin. The list thus continues with five nouns, all qualified by full, full of envy, full of murder, full of strife, full of deceit, full of malice. Now I could go on about all these depraved sins, but there is also strife and deceit and gossip and haters of God and the arrogant. Now there are the boastful who believe that they are what they are not. Then there are inventors of evil which describes people who so to speak are not content with the usual ordinary ways of sinning but they seek extra bad things and extra new vices and create new thrills and some new sin. There are those who are disobedient to parents. Once the bonds of parental Obedience are loosened or broken, really society degrades quickly. And there is the without understanding or senseless ones who are fools. They are fools because they cannot learn the lesson of experience, who will not apply the mind and brain that God has given to them. They're fools because God gave them a brain and they won't use it. They can't see the truth. They're blinded by the world. They have their desires, their sinful wants, and that's the only thing they see. There is the untrustworthy or the breakers of agreement or those who, whose word means little to them. You know, there used to be a time in our country when a man's word was his bond. When you said something, you, you knew it was going to happen. Again, I could go on and go on. It's, it's a terrible, this is really a terrible picture of mankind and the consequences of God being forced out of our daily thinking. And it's really sad, I think. And I would argue with anybody who would say it's not true because we know it's true. Number three is depraved approval. Verse 33 is a concluding summary of the human perversity. Although they, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. First thing I want you to know something, they know. They know, for the, since the creation of the world, God has made himself known to every human being. Remember, we, I've preached about this already a little bit. People do not follow God because they do not want to follow God. Not because there is no God or they believe there is no God. They'll say that, but in their heart of hearts, they know that there is God. You see, we know inherently 
or we possess a knowledge of God and his righteousness and his ordinances in us. Even those, those who have never been exposed to God's word, even those who don't read his word and Bible, they are inherently aware of his existence and his basic standards of righteousness. That's the reason babies, you don't have to teach them to do bad, but when they do bad, they know they're doing bad. Have you ever noticed that? You don't have to teach them bad. They know they're bad. You don't have to tell them no. You, who taught them to be that way? They know they shouldn't pick that up. They know. You didn't teach them that. We as humankind, we know. And yet, they say no. We know. Remember God's creation. It declares his glory and we are made to know God. Human beings are created to know God. And because they disregard their knowledge, that's what they do. They know, but they disregard this knowledge. They know the things they do deserve the punishment of death or eternal separation from God. They know that, but they do it anyway. As Paul will write later, he says, for the wages of sin is death. They know it, and their conscience condemns them, but it doesn't stop them. How were these people aware of God's death penalty? Think about that for a second. Human beings, we are created in God's image. Because we are created in God's image, we have a basic moral nature and a conscience. This truth is understood even outside of our religious circles, even outside of Christianity. Uh, psychologists know that all human beings have a conscience. And we're only human beings are the only creatures that we know of that has a conscience. Psychologists, for example, say that the person is very rare who has no conscience. And if they have no conscience, then they have a very serious personality disorder that is almost impossible to treat. Most people instinctively know when they do wrong, but they don't care that they're wrong. Some people will even risk an early death for the freedom to indulge in their desires now. They think, I know it's wrong, but I really want to do this. Or they say, I know it's dangerous, but it's worth the risk. For such people, part of the fun is going against God's law. The community's moral standards, the common sense, or their own sense of right and wrong. And you've seen people and know people that have that kind of attitude. Some of our greatest uh, criminals were that way. People who have made history knew they were wrong, but they didn't care. They wanted to do it anyway. But deep down inside, they know that sin deserves the punishment of death. So in defiant revolt against God, instead of repenting or even admitting the evil of their deeds, they promote wrongdoing and encourage others to continue to do wrong or to start doing evil. That's where it really starts hurting you and me. Because this is an absolute pit of wickedness is reached. The Bible says when those involved in evil also give hearty approval to others who practice them. In other words, they want everyone to be bad too and to do evil just like them. To justify one's own sin is wicked enough, but to approve and encourage others to sin is worse. 
Even the best of societies have had those with them. They were blatantly wicked and perverse. But a society that openly condones and defends evils such as abortions and homosexuality and the rest has reached the deepest level of corruptions. And brothers and sisters, we don't have to go very far in the history of the world to see great nations that were destroyed when they started getting that way. They started losing their morals. The Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. Many of the empires are very wealthy and very rich and very powerful. But when society lost all the rules and regulations and all the morals, they got conquered. And many of our most advanced societies in our day today were entering that category. I have a real concern for society today. So in conclusion, here in our scripture, Paul clearly portrays a deprived society, and he clearly depicts the contrast between what people know to be true and what they do. They suppress the truth so that they can do their evil. And such Rebellion, which is extreme against God, fully warrants and deserves God's wrath. The Bible clearly portrays a a, a downward spiral into sin. First, people reject God. Next, they make up their own ideas of what God should be and what God should do. Then they fall into sin, sexual sin, greed, hatred, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip. And finally, they grow to hate God and they encourage others to hate God too. God does not cause this steady downward progression into sin. But when people reject Him and continue to reject Him, He allows them to live as they choose. God gives them over or he permits them to experience the natural consequences of their sins. That's the sad part. That's a very sad part to me. Once caught in the downward spiral, no one can, no one can pull themselves up. It doesn't matter who you are. Once you're going down, 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 you cannot pull yourself. You cannot stop yourself. The only thing we can do is we must trust Jesus Christ alone and put, if we trust him, then he can put them on a path of escape. We and you maybe know people who are down in a spiral and they're going away from God. And don't we want to change them? Don't we want to pull them up? But we can't. Only God can. Many times it's our children, our children's children, our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, husbands, wives. You see them, they're going farther and farther away from God. They're not getting better. And we try to talk to them, we pray for them, and we talk to them. And when we talk to them, what happens? They get angry. And sometimes it gets worse. The only thing we can do is pray. Only God can change them. Maybe you know someone caught up in sins, depraved, this, this deceptive perversion. I invite you to please pray for them. And maybe even sometimes we even deal with some of this ourselves a little bit, don't we? Thank God we don't get so far that we can't realize and say, Oh Lord, look at what I've done and repent. But many can't. Those are the ones that we really need to pray hard for. You need to pray for yourself and you need to turn before it's too late. Let us pray. Father in heaven.